Okay, good morning, everyone. Welcome to our class, BC212, Christian Apologetics. Um, welcome all, all of you are in class, and those of you who joined us online, uh, let's pray and we will start. Father, we thank you once again for this time, Lord, to gather together. Uh, take some time to learn, and uh, Lord, even the thoughts we share, we learned this morning, uh, may be useful in our lives, and help us to serve people, minister to people, and point people to the truth. We ask for the Holy Spirit, or the Spirit of Truth, to enlighten our hearts and minds. We thank you, Father, in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Okay. Um, Today and next class, we will be dealing with two slightly difficult topics. Um, but don't worry too much. Um, um, for those who are like you know who's done some science background or some of that, uh, they may find it interesting. Otherwise, uh, it may it may seem a little too complicated. It's okay. Don't uh, don't you know don't break your head on it. Uh, just for you to know that there is information that you can use when people ask questions. Okay? That you can share this information with them. Okay? So today we're going to talk about Darwin's theory and uh, how to respond to that. Right? Um, there, there, there's, there's a lot of work in this area. One is from the side of scientists who uh, believe in the theory, in the modern theory of evolution. Uh, they write a lot of books, a lot of work and research is going on. At the same time, there is a strong response from Christian scientists, or scientists who are Christians, who are believers, who uh, challenge this theory of evolution. Right? So you have people on both sides doing a lot of work. But for us, to, what we want to do, and uh, this is lesson number six in your notes, I'd encourage you to try and read it. Okay, So don't worry if you, uh, you, know, you don't understand everything. But at least know that this is the idea, and this is the information available. Okay, um, Let me see. If people, can people online hear me? Is everything OK? All right. OK, fine. Thank you. I just wanted to make sure. Let's go back to our notes. Yeah. So I uh, just know that this information is available and some background so that if you ever meet somebody who says, I believe in the theory of evolution, how can you, you know, what is wrong with it? Then you can say, you know what to say. Or at least you make one Xerox copy of these notes and <laughs> give it to them, tell them, read it. Okay. Something, right? So you know that there is a response to it. And of course, um, th this is ongoing, you know, so both um, both sides are continuing to do research and providing response. It's an ongoing thing. So let's try to understand what this is. So Darwin, um, uh, Darwin, now it's about uh, more than 150 years old uh, uh, since he came up with this theory. But he was a uh, through his observations and all of that, he came up with this idea and the theory that life evolves from lesser forms to more complex forms. So if you want to imagine it, you can say like from one single cell, slowly it evolved from lesser life forms to where we are today, the human being. You know, it's like at the top. Very complex. And so he gave his reasoning. Uh, he gave his uh, hypothesis. So, um, and uh, what, what we're calling, he called it a theory of descent with modification and variation and selection. That means these, uh, these uh, creatures that are being formed, they are, there's modification happening, uh, uh, variation of. Uh, different parts of, of the uh, body or the morphology and 
selection. It means the ones that are most likely to succeed will continue. Those who are not strong enough will die out. So that process he came up with. Uh, and, and so that's, you know, it's known as a theory of natural selection. And it's based on four important, uh, for him, when he came up with the theory, it was based on four important, uh, four observations he made upon which he based his theory, right? Uh, and we will look at it and respond. So one is the geographical distribution of species. He said, oh, you know, how species are distributed across the world. He said, oh, so that's one indication that life form has evolved. Second was about fossils. They're finding, you know, uh, bones of creatures over time. And then they try to piece it together and say, okay, here's how things have evolved. Uh, vestigial organs, organs which have either adapted or have become not so useful. So he said, okay, as the uh, as evolution is taking place, certain organs no longer are, are no longer needed, or they are adapted differently. You're looking at that, and homology like. Similar organs, but performing different functions uh, and uh, showing that the same structures have evolved uh, uh, as a proof or uh, indication of the process of evolution. So let's look at it and we'll respond to it. So that was the basis. But what is interesting is to know some a little bit about the fact that there are actually challenges, some very basic challenges that questions that are not answered which in Darwin's time were not there. See, when, when Darwin was coming up with this theory, uh, the, the DNA and genetic information, all that was not discovered, right? Uh, so he was looking a lot at external factors, like all these four things uh, which he based his hypothesis on, or, or external factors. but. The understanding of science was not as deep as it is today. Today we know so much more. And so there are some very simple basic questions which Darwin's theory doesn't answer. And people have tried, are trying to, you know, from both sides, information is being put out. So the two main challenges. So in biology, right, first of all, every organism has, there is a biochemical activity happening inside the cell. So cell is not dormant, lifeless. Within every cell, things are happening. There are micro processes, things are happening inside the cell. The cell is so small, and inside the cell there's things happening. You know, it's, uh, intelligent processes is running. So that's happening. And another interesting thing is Information is being transmitted. What we are, uh, the cells are reproducing through transmission of genetic information. I mean, there is information being transmitted, and cells are multiplying. You know, it's like a factory. It's happening. Life is, it's being multiplied. You know, and information is being passed. And uh, even uh, when there are descendants, uh, they are, they can differ from their parents. And uh, through just these various combinations of things happening, right? So uh, just you know, uh, common various changes that are happening as these cells combine, that itself produces changes. So it's not that you're moving from one species to another, but within a species, things happen. You know, as the uh, genetic information is being combined, and so, like you know, here even just I'm using it as a very broad example. Like even among in humans, you know, let's say uh, I'm just making an example. Like say, an African marries an American, <laughs> you get another variation, right? Still human, but this variation was not caused through some evolutionary process. It was just a combination that took place differently. And so now you have so many different combinations. Right? It's not evolution, it's 
just the combination of different genetic information giving rise to something new, something very different. So two main questions. Where did this genetic information, the intelligence in our genes, where did it come from? Our genes are in one cell, one cell, there's genetic information that is describing the whole person, everything, A to Z. Genetic information is there in one cell. Where did that intelligence come from? And who decided that I can put that information inside one cell? You know, could it have just all assembled together by itself? And how could it have just assembled so intelligently by itself? That where did that uh, intelligence come from? So that's one question. The second big question is, uh, which we've never been able to explain, is before there was life or any kind of living form, organism. There was only, according to theory, there was only lifeless matter, just carbon cells, molecules. So what they're saying is somehow these molecules combined together, formed a cell, and life came into the cell. It suddenly started having this ability to, you know, all these mechanisms inside and the ability to have life and the ability to reproduce and this genetic information all assembled in that cell. So how did, you know, just randomly, how did we call it like from prebiotic to biotic or um, some chemical compounds become a living thing? How did just, so you, now you take one bottle of chemical compounds, you keep it there, keep it however long you want, it'll remain as chemical compound. It doesn't become a some organism. No. So that shift from prebiotic to biotic, or from non-living to living, how could that have happened? By random, just randomly happened. So two big questions. How did that shift from non-living to living happen randomly? Second question. How did the intelligence come inside the cell, the genetic information, the DNA? How did that happen? How did that come? Cannot answer. You, you're getting it. You're with me so far, right? Oh. So, uh, so these are two big questions that that uh, that I have not been answered. Let's look a little bit of. Uh, 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 background of Darwin. What is interesting is Darwin was actually raised in a church background, and he initially he wanted to study to be uh, uh, a priest, an Anglican priest. That is how he started. Initially, early days, um, he wanted to study to become a priest, and he had a close friend. A botany professor uh, who encouraged his uh, his interest in you know looking at nature and so on. And then uh, Darwin went on some a long voyage, traveled on on you know to different places, and that's how he observed different things. And then he came up with his theory of uh, selection. Uh, I don't uh, by the time he was about thirty years of age. Uh, he came up with this idea, and then later on he wrote um, uh, his book on the origin of species, where he put his thoughts down. He studied and put his thoughts down. But um, his ideas were not, he was not the first person to come up with this idea. Actually, there were people before him who, and if you go even from, go from uh, those before him back into, uh, earlier philosophers, 
they had ideas. Oh, life came from, you know, it just happened like that. So they kind of proposed those ideas. So he built upon those ideas. So it wasn't like he was the first person to say life evolved. He was the first person who put it all together and wrote it down in a book form or in books to communicate it en masse to many, many people. So he put this idea down with some reasoning, right? But the idea was there even before um, Darwin. So, for example, uh, Darwin's grandfather also believed in some evolutionary idea. So he also thought like this, and um, uh, he believed in those uh, ideas. Uh, and what by reading Darwin's books, it appears that Darwin's main intent was to prove the Bible wrong. So in his writings, he is he keeps and, and there are some quotes here in, 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 in this in this article that I've shared. He keeps uh, knocking on now, trying to put down the Bible theory of, not the Bible theory, the Bible truth of creation, right? So it appears that his main motivation in writing these books and coming up with this is, hey, I want to try to prove the Bible wrong. So he's not purely coming as, okay, I have done research and come up with something that I found, but Inside all of that is a motivation. I want to say, show that this Bible is not true. And that comes through his writings. He's very open about it. Uh, and that seems to be um, his, his uh, major motivation. Okay. So, so Darwin's writings predominantly argue against a creator. Uh, he's trying to say there is no creator, no creation. Uh, it happened some other way. So it's, it's in some ways like a theological argument he's trying to bring against the Bible and so on. Right? So uh, I've given some quotes here, and um, I encourage you, if you're interested, to read this. Um, so let's just look at a little bit of background, the ancient historical philosophy. So like we said, even before Daniel came along, right, uh, there, were a, there was a Greek philosopher who proposed that living things emerged from formless matter and underwent various series of changes. So somebody, a Greek philosopher, is six centuries, uh, 6 BC, came up with the idea, proposed the idea. Then there's another philosopher, a Greek philosopher, in the 5th century BC. And he also talked about how earth, fire, water could interconnect and uh, produce limbs and it was almost like imagination you know hey these things will natural elements will just interconnect and you know body parts will be created and so on uh so they came up with this idea and, the, and there were several other philosophers who came up with these ideas so it was almost like darwin in his time is building on the philosophies the ideas of these philosophers okay it's not like he was the one who came up with this idea so what was his uh, the, his four observations? Right, one was about geographic distribution. Right, that uh, species have uh, been produced in different parts of the world, and as they migrated, they also evolved as far as they could, and uh, they uh, as far as they could survive and they evolved and so he you know he said look there are some bats in certain parts of the world other kinds of uh, animals in other parts of the world um basically trying to prove the process of adaptation and therefore support his theory of evolution um so uh, So, so in uh, the case of geographic distribution, right, uh, which is through migration, and then uh, there is adaptation 
and uh, um, what we call as vicariance. There's things that are changing uh, with these uh, species. So what we are finding is, and, and what we are seeing is, there are uh, flightless birds, but there are flightless birds even in different parts of the world, which are not because you know birds uh, which which are independent. So you have ostriches in Africa, uh, you have flightless birds in South America. You have flightless birds in Australia. You have flightless birds in uh, New Zealand. Right? So we're saying there are these birds that don't fly in different continents. So we're not. So if Darwin's theory was right, then birds that you know they they should all be found in one place okay they all came they all adapted to a certain environment therefore they you know they became flightless but in different environments whether it's africa whether it's south america whether it's australia whether it's new zealand the environments are different but you still have flightless birds so you're questioning the, his theory, saying the environment adaptation to the environment caused flightless birds. But here the environment's all different. It's not like they're all adapting to the same environment, right? So again, another example would be freshwater crabs. Uh, you find freshwater crabs in various parts of the world. Right, uh, and, and we've mentioned some here um, uh, in uh, Central South America, Africa, Madagascar, Europe, India, Asia, Australia. Right. So if they all uh, started off in the same place and evolved, they would not have survived by the time they reached all these different parts of the world. But whereas when you say a creative act of God created things all over the world. Yeah, that's fine. You know, you create different birds or different things all over the world at the same time, right? Because these would not have survived if they had to move from one place through the seas and come to another place. By the time they go in the sea water, they'll die. They could not have reached another part of the world. So, um, So we are finding that you know his observation uh, of how of why birds would I mean uh, creatures would be distributed uh, is, is, is you know his theory is very different from what we are actually observing. Right? We are finding flightless birds in different parts of the world or uh, freshwater crabs in different parts of the world, which could not have just distributed across. Uh, sea water or salt water. Uh, secondly, he, he used fossils as a, a basis for his theory of evolution. But again, even in fossils, uh, we are saying, OK, uh, there are so many gaps right, that you can't fill. There is no logical uh, connection, you know, so um, we can, for example, if you, you know, you put different kinds of monkeys, chimpanzees, and then you put man at the top. It seems like, oh, this has evolved, but there are so many gaps. Like, you know, how could you say from this particular uh, type of creature it moved to the next and to the next, and the there are no, you know, connecting fossils, you know, right through. So. Uh, there are many gaps and, um, that, that, that we just can't take it as a scientific establishing of evolution just because of fossils. Um, again, with fossils, uh, what has happened is there has, there has been dispute about dating fossils. 
sometimes they'll find a fossil and say, oh, this was so many years or you know, so many thousands or hundreds, whatever, years old. Then after some time, they would date the same fossil and say, oh, no, no, last time we made a mistake. This fossil is actually, and the number of years will change by many hundreds. And so even the dating of these fossils uh, sometimes are wrong. And uh, um, it's not something that we take as absolute certainty. So there is issue. There is issue with the way fossils are dated. And so there are gaps and there are problems with dating of the fossils, which uh, cannot support Darwin's theory. Um, the third area that Darwin proposed was about vestigial organs. That means they're organs that don't seem to serve very important function. So he uses that saying, oh, that means this is a sign that the, you know, the creature is adapting and it is getting rid of organs that are not necessary. Right? So for example, he uh, pointed to the human appendix. See, he says, okay, it's not serving, it's not any use. We have the appendix. We only get some pain some suddenly. But what use? It's not serving anything. It's a vestigial organ. Uh, and he used that as an example. But over time, we begin to understand that they do some, some, uh, there is some usefulness. Although they may not be as useful as other organs, like your heart is pumping blood all the time, but the appendix serves some function uh, in terms, example, in this case, producing some antibody cells or being part of the immune system. It has some value in, in the body. Right? So the argument that the presence of vestigial organs are indicative of some form of evolution and adaptation is, is not something that holds very strong. Um, and the last one was um, where there are different organs. They are similar either in structure or they are similar in function. And he used that as a basis of saying, the organ has adapted. Uh, some changes happen. Um, so, for example, uh, in in um, similar in function, butterflies. They are butterflies and bats have wings. They are both used to fly, but the wings of the butterfly are very, what do you say, very soft and. But the wings of a bat are, you know, have bones in them or, or cartilages. They're, they're formed very differently. So he said, okay, you see that has evolved. It has adapted using that as a sign. Or similar in structure, uh, the bat has bones. The porpoise also has flippers, but that is used for swimming, whereas the bat's wings are used for flying. So, again, he was using that as a way of saying, look, that part of the body was used for swimming, but now it is used for flying. It has evolved. It has become better, and so on. But the key is, if it was the same parts that has evolved, the genetic information should be same. Because it, it, the, the way that part of the body, the genes and the genetic information underlying that structure, should there should be some connection. There should be, you know, like that same structure has evolved through some form of adaptation. Physical structure. Physic there has, it has undergone physical change, right? Like the butterfly wings have become stronger or the Popeye's flipper has become wings. It is adapted, but the underlying genetic information must remain same. Now, when you go at the genetic level, you say, like, no, 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 it is actually very different. So it is not that the same organ has adapted. The genetic information is different. So that immediately says it's not a process of adaptation. 
the way it is designed itself is different. So it kind of dis discards this theory of homology. Um, so one example would be uh, the uh, the octop the eyes of the octopus and the humans, you know, and, and so. Um, Non-homologous structures have similar genes, and homologous structures have different genes. So that really disproves in both ways that it is not a process of adaptation, but it has been designed itself. By the way it's been designed itself, it's different. So uh, the point here is that the theory, underlying theory, and the basis for which Darwin, you know, the geographical distribution, uh, fossil information, uh, structures that are looking similar, homology, and uh, what was the third one? I forgot now. Uh, vestigial organs. Uh, the four observations that Darwin used to come up with this theory, today when we look back, we say, hey, uh, these are not holding up. You know, so the basis on which he made he came with this theory is all questioned today, right? And uh, uh, we, uh, with with the uh, uh, with the knowledge that we have today, of uh, we say that uh, biology is so complex, the cells are so complex that it's not a simple. Uh, process of evolution of uh, evolving through adaptation and survival uh, we are saying that there was intelligence intelligent design uh, that and, and 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 life that God gave to everything right okay so um, yeah uh, I'll pause here for today. I just want you to take some time to read this if you are interested. I'm not forcing you. If you're interested, you read this article. Um, and you can go online and too, if you want to read the full article. Uh, so this is this lesson is only a summary of the article. But if you want more information, you can go online and uh, look at the links on the website um, that is given if you want more information. Okay. Uh, but the point is that Today, when we look back at Darwin's theory, even though when he proposed it, it seemed very convincing. A lot of people accepted it. But today, we look back and say, actually, we can question everything. And we have more information, more knowledge today. And uh, the more we study, uh, we see how amazing everything is. Of course, we understand what we are studying. but to think that all this happened by some evolutionary process is is uh, simply not you know credible for us okay all right let's pause and take some questions uh, any uh, questions from those online from those in class want to ask anything finally eventually he didn't come back to christ he's still stuck by his arguments uh, so that we don't know for sure. Uh, there are some stories that, again, we can't prove it because you know what happened when he died on his deathbed. Uh, like it's not doc, you know. Like, but there are some stories that in his final days, Darwin turned to God. Yeah, I heard, but uh, began. You know, he didn't write anything down. You know, like it was so we don't know, but there are some stories that in his final days he turned to God. But I, I don't know. But we are seeing also in today's, you know, many atheists, scientists, you know, they're turning to God. That after studying so much, they say, like, hey, definitely this could not have happened by accident. And they turn to God, you know, so that's uh, impressive. Yeah. All right. So we will uh, pause here. 
uh, just warning, next class also will be a little science only. <laughs> okay. It will be more about cosmology, the Big Bang Theory. Okay. Uh, again, I'll just try to keep it simple, simple, just summarize it. Just let you know that there is information, you can study more if you want. And lots of books, very good books have been written, you know, by uh, great scientists, astronomers, uh, and so on. So there is information, you know, if you're interested in studying. So that, and with that, we will put this subject aside and move into other things. But next class, we'll cover the Big Bang Theory and our response to it. Okay. So let's pause here for today. Thank you, everyone. Uh, we'll meet again next week.